You are now listening to Out of the Blank. 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 Welcome to another episode of Out of the Blank Podcast. I'm here with Joey Monteleone. What's going on, Rob? Did I get that right? I got it. Nailed it. Oh, my goodness. Look Couldn't at that. Couldn't have done it better. Now, he is royalty, everybody, because with that last name, apparently in Italian, it means mountain lion. That's like naming your kid Beowulf. <laughs> well, it is, it is a little bit of royalty because there are a couple – places with my last name uh, of notoriety there's a bakery in brooklyn and there's a hotel in louisiana and so whenever people visit one of those two places i always get the same picture which is is this yours which i'm gonna have to start lying and say yes immediately when i hear monteleone i think of like a like the crime family oh yeah that, like, i mean that's cory that, what is that corleone corleone family like, you yeah want to do business but business is or, we're all related, man. It's like not, you, not just Italian, but just in life. We're all related. It doesn't matter. <laughs> you're on Montelo Corner. It's like, what does that mean? We own this whole block. Every building is run by the Monteleones. You're like, oh, shit. <laughs> so awesome. why don't you tell me a little bit about yourself and what do you do professionally? Sure. Uh, so I am 30 years old. Uh, I have a wife and two little kids under the age of three. Uh, professionally, I do video and media production for a consulting firm. Uh, they like being able to quick turn over content specifically for their clients. And so they, uh, they brought me on full time to, to do things like video creation, product promos. Uh, we dabble with a little bit of podcasting. Um, and that's me professionally, but also on the side, I also host my own show called Dismantle Podcast, where we dive into issues and, and topics that uh, the church typically doesn't like to touch or doesn't handle well, uh, so that we can learn and so that we can get more information and, and gain different perspectives. Uh, I've been doing music all my life, big fan of... Uh, uh, you know, just anything as far as music production, I've been doing it for so long. Uh, you know, I've, I've actually started with uh, four track recorders with, uh, with cassette tapes and now I've kind of watched everything go digital. But, uh, but yeah, I, you know, anything within the media, music, video realm, that's usually where I find myself. So you said it changes your perspective. How so? Because I mean, my perspective has changed just talking to so many unique individuals and just people, you know, just I guess conversating, you know, deciding to take the step out the door and just strike up one. And it's crazy to see like my perspective from the beginning to where it is now, how it's completely changed. So how has your perspective changed on let's, let's kind of narrow it bit by bit. So let's talk about media. How has your perspective changed on media from when you were a kid? Sure. Uh, so when I grew up, everything was about getting a record deal. Everything was about uh, moving to Nashville or, or LA and, you know, having good enough songs that you could present to a media production company, a record label. And then the dream was to get signed and the dream was to uh, be famous, get a lot famous. of cocaine and exactly. do a lot of drugs. <laughs> Sex, drugs and rock and roll. That was the dream, right? And type and, pants. Um, Cannot yeah, and type pants. pants and and. Fortunately, that dream has come true. Pants are just getting way too tight today. You can't even fit your phone in your pocket anymore. I know. It's ridiculous. That's why, like, honestly, I never grew up using my back pocket. There's a perspective change right there. I never grew up using my back pocket, but now that's all I use my phone for. The sweat jackets with the pockets up front where it was just like a hoodie. Yeah. They made a comeback because now you can fit your phone and wallet in there because they just don't fit in your pants anymore. <laughs> it's genius. So yeah, I mean, like that, that was sort of like the dream. That was what I wanted to do. And that's really what I worked hard for. And then, you know, once everybody got a laptop, once everybody got a Mac, everybody sort of figured out that they could make their own beats and make their own music and you didn't need the record label. And so you kind of bypassed. Uh, so to answer your question, as far as perspective change, some of that does dive into technology change, whether things are advancing or changing uh, you know, the realm that we live in specifically for technology is constantly evolving. Uh, but as far as what I thought growing up, growing up uh, about 
how I needed to present myself and who I needed to know totally got flipped on its head when the power literally fell in my lap. You know, everybody was now hopping on things like noise trade and SoundCloud. And uh, even MySpace had the music function right off the bat. And so you didn't have to get uh, a label to promote you. You could promote yourself. And that's really where I sort of learned some of the, the key and instrumental tools essentially for, for doing things like podcasting now is, and, and, you know, Instagram and stuff like that, just reaching out to people and promoting yourself. Do you find that like with the way technology is going, I mean, like you were saying, it's kind of good to stay on top of where everything's kind of changing, especially when you evolve around media. Um, yeah, it's, it's difficult because there's so much new and exciting new things coming out that, your mind kind of, it starts to glaze over. It's kind of like doing a trade job. Like there's always something you, you have to learn. There's always a new system you have to be on top of. If your company starts going over to a new, I don't know, uh, you know, network or a new program, they start using to edit their videos or do whatever. It's constantly evolving and changing. It kind of make you drown in it a little bit. Yeah, a little bit. And, and I think that's a danger when you're constantly just chasing the new thing. But I think there's a difference between being aware and being sub, you know, immersed in it. Like if, uh, you know, for, for anybody who does video editing, I, I do uh, Final Cut and I do Premiere. Uh, if, if I wasn't aware and keeping up with what Premiere is doing, then eventually Final Cut's going to become obsolete. And then I'm going to have to learn it anyway. So on some level, you got to just sort of push yourself and, and be aware, maybe not dive in a hundred percent with every new thing that comes, otherwise you'll burn out. But uh, my life philosophy is that anything that doesn't grow dies. I mean, that's a, that's a scientific thing. That's a life thing, right? So if you're not pushing yourself, if you're not advancing, if you're not educating yourself, uh, eventually you will either become stagnant or you'll become obsolete. And you know, that's never a position I want to find myself in. I think like when I first got my Zoom recorder, when I first started doing podcasts, I used to do them in person and I got a Christmas present and I was like, oh, cool. I got this. Um, I had the original, like the TAC version. So I was like, okay, well, I'm trying to learn it. And I swear to God, it was the most difficult thing in the world. I wanted to give up on it. And I was like, totally. there's too many instructions. There's a play. There's all this. The quality doesn't sound that good when it's going through the original speakers inside of the thing. You actually have to put in headphones for it to sound okay. Then you got to worry about background noise and all these things. And it's like, oh my God, just give up now. But then once I started like finding, you know, another one, I used the Zoom H1, which is a little bit easier. I started realizing it's actually really simple once you get the hang of it. And then eventually like with podcasting, like I don't even know what was so difficult about setting it up before. Like I remember I got my Behringer, the thing I use now just to be able to connect into my computer. And it's like, it's not that difficult. It just, you actually, that's one of the things you need to read the instructions on for sure. It's not something like building Ikea furniture. Like I'm going to fucking wing this thing. You, know, right. <laughs> you actually have to learn the background to it, but then you start becoming so immersed in the world where like, I see so many people in the podcasting communities that always put up stuff like, yeah, which one works better for you guys, this, and they name a specific brand and then all the types of network stuff and all the statistics and all these things that they use. And then I'm sitting there like, wow, at one point you didn't know what any of those words meant. Right. Yeah. And, and I think too, there, there just does come that natural humanistic fear of whatever's unknown. But I think if you're ever going to grow, if you're ever going to push, if you're ever going to reach that next uh, summit of, of education, enlightenment, you know, you, you name the, the sphere. Uh, that could be religion. That could be politics. That could be media. That could be, uh, you know, just self-awareness. Like you got to push yourself and you got to do the work. What's really weird is that it feels like as people, we act like a community when it comes to how we kind of display ourselves in public. We all kind of show like the same autopilot person. You know, you never see those random kind of crazy individuals anymore. And if you are that random crazy individual, it is a little bit seen out of the norm. So we kind of follow a normal lifestyle. But it's weird to see with all these types of things like that are like kind of amazing in the world, such as like, you know, Star Wars, whatever you want to say, these groups and these fandoms that come out, such as like musicians. Now they started getting communities. They started craving, you know, creating more influences that are directed to the same thing that they believe in. Yeah. And uh, yeah, let's talk about Star Wars because it's oh, coming, geez. man. Are, are you a Star Wars guy? 
I have a buddy that's a Star Wars podcast. He always has me on because I refuse to watch any of the new movies. Wait, so you've have you ever seen a Star Wars film? Yeah, I've seen the older ones. Okay, then you're good. Okay. Yeah, the good ones, the ones I consider good because the newer ones, it's like, I mean, it's cool they adapted to a new audience, but when I see people that are supposed to be mystical, I like to think of them as old. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the the new ones, I don't have much faith in. I've got some nostalgia, but no, the, the original trilogy is where it's at. But if you've never seen that, we're going to have to have a different discussion. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, like, if you look at Star Wars, the fandom there, if you look at media or music in general, like, I'm a big music person. I think creativity is best in all aspects. Um, I just don't like a lot of the studio ties stuff you see today, because it seems like the company knows what is a good pitch, a good level of couple of notes that gets kind of monetized by our ears, the ones where sure. it becomes a pop hit for a month and then you never want to listen to it again. And it's like, that's all they're making music for. No, nobody's ever making music anymore to last through the generations. And if they are, they're so discredited or undercredited, like they're just not popular because they, they, they can't get popular for their hard work, which is really, really ridiculous. Yeah. And I think some of that goes back to what we were talking about before, as far as the accessibility of making music, because everybody's got it in their lap or in their pocket, essentially, some people literally make podcasts and music on their phone. There's so much content. And so, you know, like a, a song like Stairway to Heaven would come out and you'd have to sit in it for weeks and weeks and weeks. And you you really got to dive into the nuance and the beauty of the guitars and the vocals and the, and the lyrics too. And then the production quality and everything. And that got to sit there. You got to sit in that moment. Nowadays, you're absolutely right. It's every five minutes, there's a new pop hit and it's a, it's a mechanism. It's a, it's a machine. And so when people are constantly putting out product after product after product, we're just getting numb to what the product is, good or bad. You know, some of these songs are really, actually really good, but we don't have time enough to sit in them and enjoy them and, and let them stand the test of time. I think, like, I'm going to kind of diverge here onto something because I think a lot of people are like, how is he going to get to there? Well, we create these communities, we create these like-minded individuals and want to surround ourselves with other people that think the same, which is a benefit in some cases. But in the one of the worst cases I ever see where it goes in the complete bad side of things where they start to isolate people is when it does come to a religious basis. Totally. Um, I know uh, the reason I brought it there was because I know you do your podcast, the Dismantle podcast, and you talk about creating a community, not converts through, you know, discussion and stuff about topics of the church that people might find problems with. And I, I started to notice because I, I don't, I don't discredit anybody's faith. I'm open-minded to all beliefs. If there is something out there, then that's wonderful. But you're also talking to a guy who's an ordained minister on the United Church of Bacon. You know, I've dived heavily into the realm of parody religions on the concept of, I feel like every religion that has an idea of whatever it is, we're all getting a piece of the big picture. Mm -hmm. um, and it's difficult because I've talked to hardcore religious folks that are so one-sided they need to shove their opinion down somebody's throat. And I just sit there like, can you just not listen to the other person's perspective? But I've also been a kid in church myself, asked questions, and then, you know, always given the same answer. You know, you just have to believe. You just have to believe. But it's like, I kind of want to know. You know what I mean? I kind of right. want to. And that's the, that's the beautiful thing about religion. But then now if you ask questions the people just want you out of the church. You know, I know so many people that have been kicked out of their church because they just started asking questions and they were, the church was afraid that they were shaking the other people's beliefs. Yeah. And I think a lot of that comes from a lack of stability in our own belief, right? So when you start asking questions and you start, you know, forgive the bad pun, when you start dismantling things, uh, that was it, a shameless it, plug. I like it was a shameless plug. <laughs> And it's so easy too. Uh, when you start doing that, the people who have never really wrestled with, and, and I can't say it, you know, it's, it's across the board, some people who have never really wrestled with their own belief and what they truly believe when their faith comes to, uh, a, a, you know, when the rubber meets the road, that's scary, right? And, and you know, let's, let's give credit where credit is due. A lot of people haven't really had to question what they believe because they've been spoon fed it from a very young age. And the problem with religion that I see, at least from, from my perspective, is that it does become exactly what you said, an insular community, something that we get to deem who's in and who's out based on what we believe. And from a young age, we're taught 
this is where truth is. This is where community is. Church is some of our first friends. And it's where you start to really wrestle with who you are. Uh, because as we're told, you're, you're a being created in the image of God and God loves you as a plan for you. And, and, and these people all agree with that. Now, you could change that narrative and you can put anything you want in there. Jehovah's Witness, Mormon, uh, Catholic, Protestant, Jewish, you know, whatever it is, the feeling is the same. And what I started to notice is that we are becoming more and more isolated in these beliefs because we don't know what other people believe because A, we're so busy, right? Like everybody's just so stinking busy these days. Well, that's but, the common reason why most of the generation nowadays, uh, mostly the millennials, they don't have a religion to believe in. They choose not to believe in anything. Uh, there's a, about 35% of the world or America's population right now that is unbelief of anything. They're basically atheists, but they don't go under the title of atheist. You know, yeah, I think, I think they're called nuns, like N-O-N-E. I hope they're not the nuns from the church, but <laughs> not no. those nuns. it's yeah. funny because it's, it, this is a point in our history where religion in America has been at least Christianity and being Catholic or Jewish. It's the percentage has dropped so much now. Um, before the only two really common religions in America were Christianity and being Catholic, you know, right. And that has completely shifted. And you're, you know, the whole bringing up questions, you know, being and born into that or being born to believe that it's a concept of it's just so old. It's always what you did. Like nobody ever questioned going to church on every Sunday. And when they did, it was when they got older, like, wait, why are we going to church on Sunday? Yep. It was no, it was just because it was something you did. You know, that was what now you see that not happen anymore. I mean, uh, what's his name? Uh, the guy who invented Ford Motors, Henry Ford was the first person that installed um, your weekends off, like mm -hmm. your Saturday and Sunday, because people were working like every single day. And then the day off that they had was for the church, because back in the day, you did not work on Sunday. You were off on Sunday. That was God's day. So you would literally go to church. So people were like, man, we work six days a week and then we got to go to church. So we don't even have a day off. And then he was like, Oh, well, let me give you Saturday off so you can come back. And it was, it was, it seems like a nice plan, but really it was just so they would spend their money on the cars that they were making. Right. So it was kind of like a ploy, but it made sense in the concept of like, you never really brought up the question, like, why are we going to church on Sunday? No, we just, this is what we do. This is what we got to do. And it's like, we just live this lifestyle. And now in the world that we're living in now, so many people don't do that anymore. Um, it's, yeah. it sucks because I've been to some really good churches. I've seen the whole camaraderie and community aspect to it. And I love it. And, you know, obviously if there's a funeral. Where does it take place? Always at a church, um, or, you know, something where people are mourning and all this stuff. And there are things where a church is going to be in use, but at now it seems like when people say they lose their religion and they lose it entirely, they're not, they shouldn't be losing their religion and religion in general, but just maybe in that church. Cause it seems like a lot of the times it's like, you got to find the appropriate church. Cause a lot of times you can find some bad ones that just want to isolate you. Then you feel like the whole religion disbanded you. Right. And, and that's been my experience too. When I talk to people and they, and they kind of say, well, I, you know, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. Well, what you're saying is you, you had a bad church experience. Uh, but, you know, we don't do that in any other realm of our lives, right? We fall off the bike, we get back on. We don't, we don't say, well, you know, I'm all for transportation, but I, I don't do bikes. Well, no, you had a bad experience and you got to figure out what's going to work for you. And I think a lot of people are currently in a, in a phase right now where they're trying to figure out what works for them. And, and I think the church is in a, in a great environment and an opportunity to try to figure out, okay, why do we do these things? Is it just because we've always done them or is there merit to it? Is there, is there a spiritual benefit to it? Or is this just, you know, something that we've always done because we've always done it because we've always done it. That's not a great reason. And I think our generation is finally calling the BS of saying, well, why, what, what, what merit does that bring? What value does that hold in my life? Uh, because people are so now vocal and and I, I also think in our generation our, our culture right now we are constantly suspicious of authority you know the, the whole me too movement the whole black lives matter thing has really showed us that institutions if unchecked can become toxic and i think a lot of people are also diving into the church with that as well like okay you're an institution that i've always believed in 
let me just ask some questions. And if you can't ask questions of your religion, then it's not a good religion. Well, get ready for this right here because I'm about to do another plug. I'm about to dismantle religion. Now, um, when you look <laughs> at so many things in the world today, like where technology is going, it gives people more of an option, a more of an answer kind of. So when something like religion pops up and you don't really get a clear and full answer and you know how fast or how developed we have become as people, you start to question a lot more. And when yep. everyone just keeps giving you the same default answer, you just got to have faith. You just got to have faith. You just got to have faith. And then eventually they get sick and tired of telling you that. And they're just like, look, you're starting to shake other people's beliefs and you're becoming a problem. Um, it's difficult to even talk about religion. People like to think because we choose to stigmatize it so much because everyone believes in something different. And that's mm -hmm. kind of the point of religion. I think it's really, it's your own interpretation of what it means to you. I mean, I've talked to people that have taken major psychedelics and they think, you know, they have a whole other outlook on life. I know people that have studied, you know, every single scripture, everything and narrowed it down and took their faith out of that. And they were just like, I, I don't know what to believe because everybody hits around the same basis. And it's true. You know, I was, only became an ordained minister under the Church of Bacon on the concept of the true story behind that religion. The name might sound ridiculous, but really it's the concept of it was a safeguard for atheists. So many people were that were hardcore Christian were saying, you're going to go to hell because you don't have a religion, which now is being almost the norm. Most people are not believing in anything or having their own sense of what faith is. So not deeming by the Christian qualities or whatever a church's qualities would say, and those people would be attacked. So these people are like, I'm tired of feeling attacked at every corner just because I don't identify under a religion. So they created the Church of Bacon. Now that's that kind of gets a little bit more bolster to the word United Church of Bacon. Am I right? Yeah. Well, I also, I mean, I dive down parody religions because I was looking at all these religions that had funny ass names and funny stories. It seemed like they were creating a joke or a lash at religion. And I was like, is this an attack on the church or is this just a deeper interpretation for something where it starts to show that religion can mean anything to anybody? You know, there's a church called the Invisible Pink Unicorn. I've tried to sign up. Their membership is really fucking hard to get in. <laughs> but um, it's the whole concept. Like you think of God as being a man. But the funny thing about the Invisible Pink Unicorn is it's invisible, but it's pink. How do you know if it's pink if it's invisible? It's It's hard, too, because then when you start looking at all these different things, right? Like some people... I'll, I'll give it to them. Some people are like, yes, no, that's my, absolutely my belief system. But when you boil down all these other things, they boil down to just, you know, a few basic things. We want to be loved. We, we want community. And we want to know that there's a purpose in our lives. And so religion sort of makes sense of that. Um, you know, I, I have my own personal beliefs and, uh, and, and they are based off of a lot of research and a lot of uh, a lot of faith, you know, quite honestly, because I think that's really what religion boils down to is, is faith. You, you really can't prove a lot of these things. And that's where people really struggle. But at its core, people want to know that they're not alone, that there's a community aspect and that there's a bigger purpose that makes sense of things like death and senseless loss and violence. And, and that's when we turn to things like religion and the church. And when you start asking more questions and it's like, well, just suck it up, you know, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. That's not enough for people. And so they will go to the next place to find that belonging and to find those answers and, and the next place and the next place. And so we become these, these uh, sort of uh, programmed uh, little robots looking for love, looking for meaning, looking for acceptance until we find it. Especially like, I, I mean, I had a good religious experience once when I was like, um, not even that long ago, almost a couple months ago, I was driving down the road, life was kind of like I was in a tough spot. And as I was driving, I saw this butterfly flying across the street. And I swear to you, a car just missed this butterfly. And mm -hmm. I was like, damn that's all of us flying through life right now. Like we just don't even know that car's coming and we could almost get hit. And then I started driving down the road like, wow, I just had a religious experience. Then like a minute later, I started thinking, oh, he could have got hit by the fucking car. And then it would have been a whole different experience. Like life is shit, nothing's real. Everything just sucks, you know? But it's, I think it's the way we take our like kind of interpretations of things, like our, our impressions of stuff. Like, you know, the way we go about a situation. I mean, my cousin, um, was born with diabetes and his mom chose to keep him home. 
um, to kind of be homeschooled. And so he became really involved in the church. Mm. I remember on like Saturday nights, I'd want to leave because I knew Sunday morning, if I was staying at his house, I'd have to be going to church the next day. So I was like, I'm not about it, not about it. Because for me, sitting there listening to a guy read off lectures and scriptures was a little bit too much for me. You know, it sure. was making me just kind of stare at the floor like, oh, my God, when's this guy going to stop talking and tell me about Jesus and Genesis, whatever. And, you know, that's when I started asking questions. My cousin was like, hey, man, can you just do me a favor and just like do it for me? And I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, because I actually like really enjoy this stuff. And I see it like he's basically me if I was involved into the church. And as I became older, I started to understand it a lot more because I see he helps out there. They have classes with kids that teach them all about religion. And it's like telling a kid about Santa Claus, like that wondrous belief in their eyes. It's not as childish or maybe to some people it might be, but it's a belief and it's a kind of a wonderance of what's out there. Cause I believe all of us don't really want to think that once we die, that's it. Sure. And, and I think that's what sort of levels the playing field too, is that like, you know, death is, is the undefeated champion, right? Like we're all going to die and we're all going to have to pay taxes. Those are just very real realities. And, and when you die, they tax you. Yeah. It's ridiculous. You get a death tax. When did that become a fucking thing? I could say something, but I'm not going to. <laughs> Jeez, man. I mean, you can't, I swear, life just keeps messing you up long after you're dead. Yeah. And, and, and so, so we try to make sense of that. And we, we sort of like stumble through the dark, you know, like it's, it's almost like the blind leading the blind to some level. Um, but, you know, back to our, our other conversation of just perspectives and growth, like there will come a point where what you grew up with what you were raised in is not enough for you. And some people will say, cool, let's keep going and see what else is out there. And other people will go, this is it. And I'm going to dig my heels in. And those end up being the people that yell at you when you start questioning. Now, do you think that most people that yell at you for questioning is because they see it as an attack on themselves? Because I do believe the way that we take a lot of things nowadays is if you say something that someone disagrees with, they immediately assume you're attacking them. Oh, yeah. And it's, it's a hundred percent personal, that, which it doesn't, it doesn't have to be, but yeah, but that fuels a whole nother th kind of consistency. A lot of people, like, especially in the church, like that is getting attacked a lot more now where it used to not be attacked. And now sure. I think that might be on the prime aspect. I think, you know, with the part of it being, you know, a lot of people are kind of being unreligious in a way, but also the factor that everyone is looking for something that they can get angry about as well. You know, it's, We're it's constantly triggered, man. It's, Constantly. I don't know where that really came from besides social media. Well, I think it comes from, uh, I think there's a deep, uh, I'll speak from my Protestant Christian environment. I think it comes from a faulty understanding that we need to constantly be ready to give an account for the hope that's within us. That's a verse in the New Testament. And what that talks about is being able to respond if somebody asks you what's different in your life. And we've taken that mentality and we've taken it into the streets and we've taken it into uh, social media and we've, we've decided that we've got the moral right on the issue, whatever the issue is, you name it, abortion, same-sex marriage, uh, racism, homosexuality, whatever. Um, and we've decided that we're going to share with you how wrong you are. And, and everybody goes, oh, that's, that's somewhat of a new thing because of social media. No, that's the crusades all over again, right? And, yeah. and we've, it, you know, we've ha we have this thing in modern Christianity where if we can prove to you that you're wrong, then perhaps you'll come to our side of thinking. And I'll just speak from my own personal experience. I, I read through the Bible, man. I don't see Jesus debating anybody into a relationship. I don't see Jesus arguing with anybody to change their mind. I see him dialoguing. I see him having conversations. I see him inviting people to eat with him and walk with him and, and, and just be around him. And I think that's where the church is messed up today because we're trying to conform people into these, these mini Christians that we think we've got it right when we're actually doing a disservice and we're not bringing anybody closer to Jesus. We're actually pushing them further away. Yeah. And I think a lot of what in the Bible and all these other books of religion, whether it's the Quran, whatever you want to choose to read or believe in, they have the way that they get their kind of deep message across. And a lot of the times I feel like a lot of people think like, you know, especially 
for instance, like Moses parting the sea, a lot of people are talking about how that they would talk about the burning bush was known as the cicacia, the cicacia tree, which mm-hmm. is supposed to give you major psychedelic high. So then people start to question if he actually parted the sea or was it just they were all tripping, which sure. makes sense. And then you look at things like, you know, Jesus walking on water. Was he walking on water or was he standing in shallow water? You know, it, 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 it's all there because we weren't there to see it. So we're just taking another person's perspective. So if you're already questioning your belief and you hear that, you start to question it a little bit more. But when it comes to religion, when it comes to these things, I believe that whatever your own interpretation or deep meaning behind it is like the same reason with Pastafarianism. Um, the guys worship a giant spaghetti monster. It was yeah. meant to be a giant joke. But then I actually started podcasting and kind of talking about that religion. We did a narrowed down topic on that in general, just me and my buddy just learning about it and laughing at it. As we started reading it, we started actually kind of believing a little bit of what they understood because it was all the concept of a guy from Harvard in 2006 decided to show the bad side of the education system, how they're only teaching a one kind of religion belief, you know, Christianity, but they're not educating to all the other cultural religious beliefs, such as Judaism and all these other things. And it was a a way to highlight that kind of, I guess, structural thing that we go to live by, I guess. So, you know, you get to see a, a whole change in the way people start to evolve into their own interpretations of things, whether they're just taking, you know, a long walk for a short drink of water or they're actually finding some deeper meaning out of it. I mean, I've known people that are, you know, believe in God 100% and look and pray and talk about angels and demons and all these things all the time because they've had no severe trauma in their life that has gotten to them to that point. It's also when you look at people that are, you know, really into the church is because, you know, they have a kid or something and they realize this is like the most beautiful moment in my life. That means there has to be another creator out there. I don't, right. think, I don't think that's wrong at all. And I'm willing to, you know, hear that. But it's the concept for me, I, it just because I can't wrap my head around it or I haven't had that come across point yet doesn't mean you have to force it down my throat. I think that's a bad way of kind of tackling it that a lot of churches do try and do is try and com- like, I guess, convert you in a way. I sure. mean, for me, when I dived into parody religions and everything like that was highly on the case of when I was walking on my local town's boardwalk, which is like three miles of just wood planks where it's like amusement park rides and stuff. There's two people reading scripture on the boardwalk. Now, that wouldn't have bothered me except while I have my headphones in, they're screaming and pointing at people, telling them they're going to be condemned to hell since they don't believe in Jesus Christ. And I was like, hang on a second. Like, aren't like, aren't we all just trying to make it on this world together? We're trying our hardest just to survive. And you're making it more difficult if you start condemning people to hell for not having a belief. Like, like you said before, a lot of people work a lot. So it's very, very hard for them to get that hour or get that two hours to go to church. You know, they choose to pray at home. So it's like just because someone doesn't have that understanding or doesn't have that wantingness to believe in something, does it mean that that they're banned to hell for it? It doesn't make that person a bad person. When you look at the kind of detailed, I guess, gateway into heaven or whatever religion, they all fall on the same basis, which is why I say we get a piece of the big picture. Every religion does. You do good things. You go to a good place. You do bad things. You go to a bad place. It's a way to act with morals and values through our society. You know, a lot of things like that we're built upon and living in are very, very structured. And it seems like when the church starts to seem really, really structured is the one thing you're never supposed to have structure in is in belief. Yeah. And I think the. At least for me, this is what it boils down to, like, what's what's the fruit of your life, right? Like, if this is your belief system, that's great. Your belief system talks about love. It talks about acceptance. It talks about grace. It talks about mercy. Are those things evident in your life? If they are, cool. Then that's going to be more of a, that's going to be a louder megaphone than you trying to give me a track. Um, And that goes for any religion. Like, you know, what is the evidence in your life of your belief? If, If you're a completely different person from what you were, by coming into contact with the person of Jesus Christ, that's going to speak a lot louder than, than you trying to, you know, just do good things. Like that's the evidence. And I think that is the problem with the church is that a lot of people come to church looking to this institution to be changed. 
when at least for me, it's, it's a person that changes you. It's a relationship. And, um, you know, that's some of the reason why I started the show is because we're looking at this institution with all of its flaws and it's hundreds and hundreds of years of mistakes in order to save us. And it, I don't think it was designed to do that. And so if you can have a conversation with a homosexual and expand your understanding, great. Can you talk to a tattoo artist? Can you talk to a single mom? Can you talk to, uh, you know, somebody with a porn addiction? Can you talk to somebody, um, who, you know, has a different view from you? That, that was really the, the goal because I think if we continue to keep looking at these institutions and these structures that we're never supposed to fulfill, they were only supposed to guide, uh, we're, we're always going to be frustrated. And eventually these structures are going to go the way the Buffalo. So, okay. What types of topics do you try and focus on? Do you just cover all aspects of religious or beliefs or do you just try and focus on things in the church? So for me, everything has a, a spiritual connection. And I say spiritual and I don't mean religious. I, I mean spiritual. There's a spiritual connection to everything you, you can do. So when I first started out, it was like, oh, I'm going to talk about these things because the church doesn't talk about them. Uh, now it's, it's really developed and evolved over time with, I just want to talk to people who are passionate about topics. Um, you know, our first 10 episodes, I think we talked about church planting and agnosticism, secular humanism, um, you know, just, just things that the church didn't really talk about very well. And more lately, it's been artists and musicians who have a unique perspective. I mean, we've talked about everything from adoption to abortion, um, deep theological issues, like things like Calvinism, um, you know, we've, we've dove into spiritual warfare, like you mentioned, angels and demons. And, um, and there, then there's been other episodes about songwriting and, um, you know, you know, just basic things, because again, I think there's a spiritual connection. Uh, I've had my tattoo artist come on a couple of times and we've just talked about the, the mindset and the mode that you kind of dive into when getting inked. I mean, you know, some of that stuff you'll never hear from the pulpit. And that's really what I was noticing. Like these are deep conversations. These are good conversations, but you will never hear them on a Sunday. And so how can we capture them and then release them in a way that says, Hey, listen to this. You might actually grow. Yeah. I think especially when you're doing something so intimate as to giving somebody a tattoo. I mean, you're sitting down for a few hours at a time. You got to get to know the person as well. Yeah. You can't exactly. just sit there and be quiet the whole time. That's going to be an awkward tattoo. Yeah, it will be. <laughs> But, you know, like even even within that, I mean, uh, his name is Derek. Uh, Derek and I have had so many conversations that have changed my perspective, A, because I'm not going anywhere for a couple hours, and B, because I've been in a, in, in a mode and a mindset that says I want to receive. Um, and I think that's the position that we as humans and we as uh, religious and spiritual individuals need to take a little bit more. I want to receive. I don't have it all. I don't know it all. And I'm just going to take that seat and I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to receive. And, you know, there's not always going to be applicable stuff, you know, like sometimes you'll, you'll take it and you'll say, yeah, this is really good. And then other times you'll be like, no, that, you know, there've been episodes where I've completely disagreed with the guest, but that's not my job. My job isn't to necessarily defend what I personally believe. It's to capture the content and then release it and say, Hey, you got to figure out what this means to you. I think it's the concept of staying open-minded. I try and do that my hardest when I'm in a podcast. And, you know, I find that staying open-minded doesn't eliminate anybody's side of view. Um, I've been on podcasts with people that just want to get into an argument. And just because you don't necessarily, like I'll, I'll tell people, I don't, it's not saying I might disagree with you. I'm saying, do you ever look at the other side's perspective? Mm -hmm. And it's, it's about tackling it from their perspective and really taking the time to have a conversation. Because if you deny yourself, you know, just a conversation in general, you're denying yourself of information. Doesn't mean it has to be right information and it's never, ever wrong information. It's just another person's perspective and another person's upbringing and understanding of how they even got to that. Yeah. And, and back to something you had said before, like, wh what does that take away from you? What does that mean to you? Like, does that, uh, does that offend you? Does that assault you? Like, w when did we as a culture get to the position where somebody's thought process immediately needed to be destroyed? Like, that's ridiculous. It feels like where people always say, you ever come across like toxic people? Absolutely. It seems, it seems like it's it's not even really 
being toxic people anymore. It's toxic groups because now those toxic people start making more toxic people. And eventually you have these groups that are so toxic that you don't want any involvement in anymore. And it's like, we've lost the initial belief. You know, if you tell a kid a story and you tell them to pass it down the line of 50 other kids, by the time it reaches that last kid, that story is going to change. And I think that's the way like a lot of religious and a lot of systems, anything like this, that started out with a pure intent and then ended up changing and adding things where it ends up looking like, where did, where did the start come from? Like, how did we get here? Yeah. And I think we need to, I think we need to recognize that. I agree with you a hundred percent. Like, I don't think there's malicious intent in the way these things were started or where they even are right now. I, I don't think there's malicious intent. What I do think is there's a mindless Uh, lack of integrity to look and dive into the belief system and say, does this make sense? Because if it does, great, then we've done it. But if it doesn't, you might have to reevaluate. I think a lot of people look for evidence on what something has to make sense or does it have to have evidence or can it just make sense to someone else? Yeah. Well, you know, for, for, for that argument, some things are toxic and we can all kind of agree like, Hey, that might make sense to you, but that's not beneficial. Yeah. Like if you inject healthy cocaine into your veins or something, that's probably not the healthiest option. I would go, I might recommend if you want to stay up, maybe try a little bit of coffee or, you know, something, but I think it's, it's a crazy concept because like I said, the information, I mean, we're in the information age right now, and it seems right. like it's only getting more and more expansive. Well, we're trying to go everywhere all at once, and we're not really taking the time to take count of the things that are happening around us at the moment. We're more worried about the future. Yeah, and 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 that's and I would I would admit that that's sort of on my mind. Like I I see all the problems with the church, but I still love the church. I still think it's got great potential to be a powerful force in the world um, that for, for right or wrong, good or bad, you know, we're, we're still people. And, and because we're people, we will always fall short. That being the case, I'm sort of looking down the line now that I've got two little kids. I'm like, well, what am I handing off to them? Do I want to give them what was given to me as far as a dysfunctional system that never questions anything? Or do I want to offer something that says you can wrestle with this and when you come out the other side, you will be better for it? Do you you have kind of a fear for your kids growing up in the world that's constantly changing today? Do you think that it's going to either change them as people, even though you might try and structure them so much? Yeah. I mean, that's, I think that's just a basic fear just in in life. Like, you know, what are they going to end up doing? What are they going to grow up to be? How are they going to see the world? Are we always going to agree on things? Um, You know, that's, that's just a basic fear because as they're young and they're cute, you know, you get to mold them and you get to shape them and and things like that. But I've also kind of, again, looking down the line, know that they have to be who they are and they have to be individuals. Uh, Am I concerned in the world that we're growing up in? Sure. But my parents were way more concerned than I am about me. And, um, and looking back, it wasn't really that bad. So I think hindsight is sort of 2020 where you kind of get to be like, uh, you know, maybe it wasn't that bad and, and maybe there was some good and growth within that. And so I try to have that mentality too, like, you know, as, as fearful and, uh, anxious as I could be about their future. Like I have to remember that I don't see the full picture right now. I think that's an amazing perspective to come from too. I mean, it's very, very hard for a lot of people to kind of see, I guess the the future for their kids only on the concept of back in the day, there was always a thing that worked. Like you go to college, you're getting a job. And nowadays you see like getting, going to college doesn't even get you a job anymore. Right. You know, it's, it, we're changing in a very, very weird way. And especially it's, it's making new styles of parenting now. And it's making it also very difficult to be able to raise your kids properly um, when it comes to the concept of trying to make sure they get everything that they need to be set out for the world because you don't even have that yourself anymore. You know? Sure. The, sure. And, and I think, oh, go ahead. Well, with the job systems changing, people that think, oh, I worked in this company for 40 years and then I'll retire. That's not even happening anymore. Now the retirement's not enough that they have to work more. I saw a 90-year-old woman in a grocery store bagging people's stuff. I'm like, what happened? She's like, my retirement wasn't enough. I was like, damn. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, a, you know, it's a moving target, essentially. And um, what I think 
you know, you, you, you kind of hope for the best and you work for the worst, right? Like, you know, you hope that things are going to work out and, and that things are going to go the way that that would actually provide some structure and foundation for them. But at the same time, like some of that responsibility does fall on you um, to, to work your ass off and, and sort of say like, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to do everything I possibly can aside from manipulating and controlling them. You know, I've been in environments where, where the parents have uh, dictated and used fear and manipulation to kind of control the kid. And then when they're older and they're adults, like they don't know how to function. So, you know, I look at parenting, I look at my kids as I need to make sure that they're functioning members of society and that they're morally upright. I'm going to work my ass off as far as it goes with religion so that they know how to navigate that. But I want to teach them how to think, not what to think. Ah, so more of like just kind of not really forcing your opinion, but inserting an opinion, you know, just letting them know, like, this is what I think. Yeah. I, think I think that's a better way of coming at things that a lot of people try and do. Like, I try and tell people, like, you have the only control of your own life. You are yep. the keys to your car to drive it. Anybody that throws in their opinion, throws in anything, is just your GPS. They're telling you what you should be doing, but you're the only one that can choose to go left or right. So if you choose to follow them, then that's on you. But just remember that at any moment you feel like you're not in control, you got to keep in mind that you are in control. You are the person that walks the steps that you walk. Right, right. And, you know, I've, I grew up in a very traditional, conservative, fundamentalist Christian environment that was told, that, you know, that told me this is what you believe and we don't question that. And when that didn't become enough for me and, you know, I, I it was a long process, man. There was a lot of therapy involved, not necessarily undoing my belief system, but understanding myself and, and kind of breaking off some, some toxic behaviors and mentalities. I, I kind of came out the other end of that going, I never want to do that to another human, you know, whether it's my kids or it's the people that I, that I lead at church or, or the people that I have on my podcast. I, I don't want to tell you what you need to believe because it works for me you know, back to our other conversation, I want to live in a way that shows a transformed life. And if that's interesting to you, we can have that conversation 100%, but I'm not going to shove it down your throat. That's true. I mean, that's, I think that's the best way people need to start looking at the world now, instead of trying to force something or change somebody, don't be afraid to throw out your opinion. Don't be afraid to throw out a question or something, but just remember that the answer it's, it's, it's never going to be a forced opinion. It's going to always, it's, you got to come at it with a rational expectation and also become more open-minded because when you start to close your mind off, you just want to isolate yourself and stick to certain groups, which really does yourself a disservice. I mean, the amount of knowledge you can gain from someone that might have a different belief than you, but still has other things in common with you. And you're going to just deny that whole conversation in general because you didn't agree on politics. Like, come on now. It's the same thing. I mean, like, you know, this is super simplistic, but, uh, you know, the first time you ever had peanut butter, you didn't know what peanut butter was. And if anything, it didn't look really appetizing. It looked kind of uh, gooey and smooth. And all of a sudden it's on a sandwich and it's got this jelly thing, but you had to trust the individual giving you the peanut butter and jelly that this was beneficial. And if you don't like it, that's fine, but you got to try it. And I think that's where our culture is right now. We don't want to try anything. We don't want to listen to anybody. You know, don't mess with what I've already worked so hard, quote unquote, to establish. And that's dangerous if we come to those conclusions that nothing can ever shake, uh, you know, what I believe about something. Uh, if, if it is rock solid, then listening to something else isn't going to move that. But if it's not, then you might grow. And that might be a good thing. It's just like we're all flowers trying to kind of blossom towards the sun, I guess. Exactly. Well, thank you so much, Joe, for being on the podcast, man. It was awesome having you, dude. Dude, I loved being on. Thank you so much for a great conversation. I want to give you a minute here at the end to kind of promote your content so people can find your podcast. Sure. Uh, it's, it's sort of tongue in cheek, uh, but our podcast is actually ending on uh, November 25th. Um, there's a couple reasons as to why we're, we're bringing it to a close, but if you were interested in the podcast, it's dismantle podcast. You can find it on Apple podcasts. You can find it on Spotify. We're on Google play, SoundCloud, Stitcher. And I think that's it.
or, or on some, uh, SoundCloud, I think I said, but anyway, uh, yeah. So we dive into conversations and in an attempt to grow and to learn and to make the church a better place. Uh, we just released episode 111, something like that. And, um, and uh, yeah, at the end of this month, we are bringing it to a close and there's some really cool reasons as to why, and that's going to be shared, but yeah, go check those out. We're on social media under dismantle pod. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. If you're leaving, are you going to something else? Are you going to branch off and do something new maybe in mind? Haven't decided yet, but you know, since we're, since we had such a good topic, I'll give you some of the, you know, one of the main things and, and some of that's just recognizing the season. Uh, I feel like we've kind of learned how to have these conversations. And so now I want to go do it and not just constantly, uh, you know, practice week after week within the podcast. As far as creativity, there's always something I'm burning. Uh, but as far as a new show, nothing on the horizon yet. I have, I have a good one for you. I'm ready. Call it the Montalone Services. <laughs> and just do a bunch of gang and like mafia type style stuff. I would listen to it, dude. You got to create an audio book store, like a fake history about the Montalones. Dude, I'd be, I'd be down to be a part of that for sure. <laughs> I'll get working on it right away, actually. It sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks so much, Joey, for being on. And thanks for listening to this episode of Out of the Blank Podcast. And stay tuned for our next episode.